Hello everyone, welcome back, Stuart Sandbanks. We're on uh, episode 23. I'm reliably told um, I've lost track myself. I hope you're all well. I hope that you've got a bit of spring in your step this week with the announcement, uh, being cautiously optimistic around that and having a few more daylight hours. Um, so today we have a real treat because we've got John McKendrick QC with us. Hi, John. Hi, Emma. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, today we're talking about a really interesting topic um, and a really important topic actually for everybody watching this um, webinar will deal with clients who lack capacity and best interests has certainly come to the fore in my caseload recently and it's a, a topic of huge importance and John's kindly agreed uh, to talk to us a little bit about that. Now John has a really wide ranging practice and you're an expert in many things and but one of those things is a uh, court of protection um, and we thought we'd talk a little bit today about the practical application of the legislation. We're not going to get bogged down in, in the legislation as such, but talking about the practice of best interest decision making. So I've taken enough time talking as usual, John, so I'm going to dive in and just ask you a first question, um, which is how, how do we know when a best interest decision actually needs to be made and when I when I um, asked you about this I said to you I, I couldn't believe that best interest best interest wasn't actually defined in legislation I find that interesting and and how, how do we know when a best interest decision needs a formal process with a wider consultation and when a decision can just be made well it, it's an excellent question and it's not particularly easy to answer and this is certainly one of the challenges in the area of mental capacity law and practice, that you can look to the Mental Capacity Act 2005 and to the statutory code of practice, and you get a lot of the answers, but not all of the answers. Best interests is um, set out in terms of a check, statutory checklist in section four, and it sets out a number of areas decision makers have to consider. And in everyday life of the mentally incapacitated, there are decisions that fall to be made and they are best interest decisions. For example, let's just call, I don't like using the initial P, but it, it's a helpful initial P. Um, this evening, should P have a fish salad or should P have a burger and chips? It's a best interest decision in which you have to weigh up. Do you have the healthy option or the unhealthy option? What pleasure? What, what are their wishes and feelings and views? All the way through to the most significant best interest decisions, which could involve life-ending treatment. Mm -hmm. So how do you know where to go? Well, uh, many best interest decisions are simply taken as part of people's day-to-day -day care. But in respect of more serious best interest decisions, where the consequences for P are significant, and particularly where there may be disagreement by either those offering or providing the care or a family member, then it is important to think about formalizing the process, gathering information, particularly people's wishes and feelings, beliefs and values, and thinking about having a more formal best interest decision and minutes. The extent to which that is necessary will depend. It may well be that um, you're trying through the best interest process to reach agreement. That's almost like a form of mediation, mm. or it may well be because the decision maker thinks this is probably going to end up in the court of protection because there is a dispute which is enduring and it's serious, we have to go to court. So you, the decision maker wants a proper documented process as to how a decision has been arrived at. Mm. It's, it's really, it's funny, isn't it? Because along in this area, I find anyway, it's very much about judgment calls, isn't it? It's about weighing up options and considering the person and considering the family. And there's no rule book, which was, is what makes this so difficult. And to a large extent, we know that it's important to consider P's best, uh, uh, sorry, previous wishes and feelings. Uh, how, I mean, the question, I suppose, is how important are those historic Wishes and feelings. I mean, they're they're extremely important um, because if, if you begin from the perspective of if there is a case in the court of protection, um, really one of the things that the judge will always want to know about is P's current wishes and feelings, past wishes and feelings, because when they apply the best interest test, they have to place quite significant 
weight on that. And some leading authority has really made clear that the importance of these wishes and feelings and the weight to be given to those wishes and feelings is not something to be easily discounted. As one senior judge said, just because you're incapacitated doesn't mean there's an off switch about your wishes and feelings. So how do you go about obtaining that? Well, sometimes people will have written things. Sometimes people will have said, this is what I want to happen in certain scenarios. They may have formalized that to give legal effect to it. They may not. Mm. They may have, for example, uh, I've seen lots of different types of scenarios where, for example, P is incapacitated, but when they had capacity a couple of years ago, they, they saw their wife have a stroke and saw their wife poorly in hospital and turned to their children and said, oh, if I ever get sick, don't, don't have me connected to a bunch of wires. I don't want to live like this. So by speaking to family members, speaking to other people involved in P's life, you can get a sense of the sort of, of, of their views on things like medical treatment. But also it's important, we have to imbue these decisions in the, in the humanity yeah. of P. And the dignity of P means you have to, what was this person like? Were they adventurous? Were they someone who traveled? Or were they somebody who liked staying at home and were more timid? Was this a gregarious person who would want to see lots of people? Was this a person who, who liked a quiet life of reading? All of these types of issues can impact uh, any best interest decision. And it's important to try and elicit that information because all, above all this, as I say, to repeat two important words is about humanity and dignity. Mm -hmm. And for those who cannot make decisions for themselves, you have to understand that person yeah. if you're making a substituted decision in their best interest. Yeah. And that for us, as from you know, speaking as a solicitor from a case point of view, that's all about knowing the family and having a really good feel of friends and social life. And because so, we're detached from it so much more, so it's an evidence gathering from that point of view. And we talk, we talk about a decision maker, um, and perhaps a decision maker might seem like it's like it's obvious and I suppose it might depend upon the type of decision that's being made but for instance in our cases we've got if we have a litigation friend for somebody then we we kind of presume that person will probably be the decision maker how, how true is that and who, who is the decision maker? Um, I mean there is there is some commentary in the code of practice about who decision makers can be I mean principally if it's a social care decision it's probably uh, a decision maker at the local authority, a senior social worker. Mm. If it's a medical decision, it will often be a clinician. And in fact, a lot of large trusts have very well arranged best interests um, committees who effectively come together, bring in the family, bring in the nursing teams, bring in therapists to make a decision. Um, but it, it could be somebody else. Um, the difficulty is when there is disagreement or conflict, it's important to try and find a decision maker who can be seen to have carried out a proper process, consulted, yeah. discussed, held a meeting, and ministered that meeting to make it as clear as possible. But it's in many, in many health and social care cases, which is what we and, and you will, will often be concerned with, it's probably the, the commissioner effectively yeah. who has to consider and make the decision. And sometimes that's, as I say, is obvious. Other times it's not quite so clear, particularly if there might be joint funding between a CCG and a local authority. There can be some issues there that have to be looked at. Yeah. And you've touched on this already, um, John. I don't want to go over ground that we've covered because we have so little time, but but I'm, I'm interested in the best interest meeting process and how to kind of identify when that's required, who should be consulted and invited to that. Does it, I mean, does it matter um, who takes the minutes and um, what preparation from a practical point of view is required. And I know I've asked you about 55 questions there. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's fine, you'll get 55 different answers probably. <laughs> it, it's, it, classically, it all depends on the decision, the decision maker and possibly the extent of disagreement and the gravity of the decision. But let's take a serious decision, for example, a medical treatment issue, mm -hmm. um, you would want to have a wide range of people invited. You would want to ensure that you go out of your way to invite those who may disagree or be difficult, because those are the types of people whose views are particularly important. You might want to include, it, it, 
if he has an advocate of, of some nature ensuring that they're invited, you would want to have possibly minutes and an agenda and some written reports, um, written reports regarding the nature of the medical treatment, the risks and the consequences. Let's say it's a decision to move somebody from a rehabilitation unit to their own residence or to a supported living placement. Um, again, what, what is the information that's necessary? Look at the types of information that people would reasonably need to understand, to form a view. And who should be the, the minute taker? Well, you know, somebody who is, is relatively independent in the process right. and they should record what people said as much as they can and then clearly summarize the best interest decision with the reasons for it at the end of that document. And then probably send the minutes to those who were invited asking them to agree or disagree. And there can often be disagreement about that, but these documents can be very important. And sometimes in court protection cases, they are scrutinized and people are cross-examined on the views that they gave at a best interest meeting and how consistent they are with the evidence they are, they are giving in court. So they are important documents, but at the end of the day, what you're really trying to do is to reach an agreement and make mm -hmm. the right decision for this individual person and bring people together to get a wide variety of views so you understand and to go through the section four checklist, bring in everything necessary and make the best decision for this person as against the available options, the available resources. You don't make best interest decisions which are hypothetical and where there is no funding for that placement or contact with these people isn't possible or that treatment isn't offered in the NHS and they cannot afford it privately. Yeah, as you say, that particularly in relation to these bigger decisions like moving someone from a rehab placement to their own home or, you know, considering that next step is a massive one. And that's often the subject of these these types of meetings. Um, and they're often the most controversial um, decisions. They often give rise to a dispute, as you've alluded to. Sometimes there isn't agreement amongst family members or other parties that you, you just, you don't necessarily come away from that best interest meeting with a consensus. So what happens in that situation? Well, um, if you've, you've had the meeting, there remains disagreement. It, it, in most cases, um, that will make it difficult for the decision maker to implement what their recommendation was, which yeah. remains uh, without agreement. And the law is pretty clear. If, if it continues to be lack of agreement, then it's the judge of the court of protection who must make the decision. Yeah. And the decision maker will have to file an application before the court of protection with evidence, including the minutes of the best interest meeting, and identifying those who are involved and indeed who may well be respondents to any application because they object. Now, that, that, that can be uh, a, a long and complicated, difficult process. There is some recent case law that says, for example, um, if there is agreement, even in a case, for example, of continued artificial nutrition and hydration, uh, which would inevitably, the withdrawal of that would inevitably lead to the patient's death. If everybody's in agreement, you don't have to go to court. So some quite significant decisions can be made if everybody is in agreement, clinicians, family, uh, the decision isn't finally balanced and there's unanimity regarding the medical evidence. But yeah. in relation to a much, a much, if you like, lesser decision, who someone should have contact with or where they should live um, or what support arrangements should be provided for them, if there is a relative or a friend who's close to them, partner, an advocate who disagrees, then you're looking at going to the court of protection, I'm afraid. Yeah, which can be so lengthy and and expensive. I understand as well. It's 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 not straightforward. And I wonder, do, is there any place for mediation in this area? Well, that's that is an under researched area. Um, but my view is that mediation is helpful and appropriate. I have seen it try successfully and unsuccessfully, as you would imagine, in, in some cases. But I think um, there there needs to be much more thought to mediation. And it is something I think that can play a role. It would be great to see further research on its effectiveness. But my personal view right now is that I, I wouldn't want there to be mandatory mediation, particularly yeah. if I can add to delay. Yeah. If anybody watching has any experience of um, mediating in, in this type of situation, I'd be very, very interested to hear from you. Please do drop me a line. Um, and last question, so we've got, got less than a minute, John. <laughs> 
I was rushing at the end, but do, can I have some uh, some top tips for case managers, carers, family members, anybody really relevant that might be watching, might be involved in this type of process? The most important thing in trying to resolve best interest disputes is for any person who's got a relevant role to try and take themselves out of the picture mm. and focus on P, focus on the person P is now, even if unable to make a decision, and focus on the person P was when they could, if they were able to make decisions. And try to put yourself in that situation to look at the issue from P's perspective. Because in so many conflicts in the court of protection, I see clinicians, social workers, family members, uh, professional deputies, looking at this is the professional role, or this is my view, or this is what he said to me, and there's unnecessary disagreement. Trying to think about best interests from P's perspective, because that really imbues the decision-making with the respect, autonomy, and dignity that we would all want to see if we were in that position ourselves. Yeah. Thank you so much, um, John. Such a fascinating and, and really very important area. And um, I'm very grateful for your input. Thank you. Um, as always, we have such limited time that we don't have um, enough time to squeeze in questions. So if you have any questions following this, please follow them up uh, with me by email and we'll get a response to you. Um, and thank you, John. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, everybody, for joining us.